Hello. Hello. Konnichiwa. Konbanwa. Hello. Konbanwa. <laughs> Good morning for you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, it's actually a nice morning. It's snowing.、Mm. We have a、oh, real winter.、Snowing. Yeah, since、uh, actually a few days we have winter time here. So right,、uh, Pavel San also showed us the very snowy Wrocław in the talk that we had earlier this week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's start this this talk. I'm I'm really excited about you know、mm. these last the days of sharing all the documents and、um, materials and ideas with with our audience. We have a series of artist talks.、Mm -hmm. Yesterday we connected uh, from uh, Tokyo, Sapporo, <laughs> and Wrocław to Berlin and Vienna. <laughs>、mm -hmm. Today we have、um, also a very nice group of young artists、uh, that、um, that are working,、um, yeah, in Germany. That's that's something that connects them. Oh right, all of them are based in Germany now. Yeah, Joanna yeah. Moll. Joanna Moll is based now in Barcelona、uh, and Berlin, but she、mm -hmm. she she uh, also uh, teaches every once in a while in at, at German art universities. She was she was active.、Uh, And she's、mm -hmm. still involved in、uh, different activist <laughs> actions in Berlin, but she she's based uh, um, in Barcelona.、Uh, um, Joanna Moll.、Um, we have also Charlotte Eiffler.、Uh, who、um, let me、um, let me just cut in because I think Japanese audience Japanese is also really important. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I'm terrible. Sorry. I'm <laughs> sad. <laughs> はい。なので、あのまずアーティストを呼びする前には少し日本語でもあの、えー、この今日のトークの概要をお伝えしようかなと思ってるんですけれども、まああの、えー、昨日はですね、アグニーシカさんモデレーションのトークで、えー、札幌と、えー、まあ私東京とまあ繋いだ後にですね、あのアグニーシカさんがポーランドのブロッツワフ、そしてアーティストの皆さんはベルリンやウィーンから繋いでいただいて、すごくそのトークも楽しかったんですけれども、今日の、えー、登場するアーティスト、えー、みんなすごくあの若いアーティストですけれども、えー、みんな。皆さんは、えー、ドイツ出身か、まあ、ドイツに拠点を置いているってことが今日のまず、えー、アーティストたちの共通点ということで、えー、ジョアナ・モールさんは、まあ、今あのベルリンとバルセロナ拠点にこう移動しながらあの作品制作を進めていて、ただ、まあ、ドイツでもこう学校で教えたりもしているので、まあ、みんなドイツにゆかりのある作家だねというお話でした。Yeah, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, mm. Charlotte Eiffler,、uh, she lives in Leipzig, which is a very exciting city that is being called now the New Berlin. <laughs> But she was born in Rostock at the sea side in the former GDR. I think this is this is important to mention. It's kind of、uh, yeah special to be born in a country that. Doesn't exist anymore. <laughs>、um, yeah. Yeah. That's your part now, Kanoko-san. Eh, so this, ne. So, 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 ニューベルリンと<笑>呼ばれているそうで、まあ、ベルリンっていうのは、まあ、あの、あの、アーティストたちがたくさん、えー、生活をしていて、まあ、あの、生活費もそこまで、あの、高くないので、こう、たくさんいろんな新しいことが生まれている街っていう印象が、まあ、現代アーティストたちの中にもあると思うんですけれども、あの、まあ、このニューベルリンはこのライプシヒだということで、あの、そちらに拠点を置いているそうなんですが、あの、まあ、出身は、えー、ローストックというところで、まあ、これはあの、ミベの町で、まあ、東ドイツ、あの、の、えっ、ー、と、まあ、町だったので、まあ、その、生まれた当時は、えー、その、東ドイツだったので、まあ、今はもう存在しない国の出身であるっていうことは、彼女のアーティストの、あの、アイデンティティにとっても重要なのではないかということです。
Hi. <laughs> Uh, Caroline Liebl and Nicolas Schmidt-Feller, uh, they are based in Offenbach, um, a neighboring city to Frankfurt am Main. It's a city located on the other side of the uh, river. Uh, they, they studied there and actually we know each other since, wow, already something like eight or nine years. <laughs> so I've learned uh, them as they were still uh, studying at the art school in Offenbach. Um, they are our uh, last guests in today's round. で、ケロリン・リーブルさん、ニコラス・シュミット・フフェーラーさんっていうのは、えオフェンバルグというフランクフルトに近い町に、えー、拠点を置いてまして、で、あのー、まあ、えー、アグニシカさんは、こう、学、彼らがオフェンバルグで学生時代に出会っているので、もう8年、9年の付き合いになります。Um, yeah, so, um... All the artists uh, work with uh, within the, the broad field of media art um, and um, their practice will serve us to uh, decode this little bit uh, mysterious title of today's talk. It is media slash internet. Of course, uh, it is an artist talk. So we will be talking about um, about these two very, you know, broad, very huge words. Yeah, I was just saying art. that in Japanese too earlier. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's a big title. <laughs> it's a big title. So let mm. us, you know, decode because maybe I can propose some path through this uh, huge, um, mm. you know, um, um, title, huge package. Mm. Yeah, so media and internet, of course, in the context of art and art practice. Mm -hmm. じゃあ、あの、で、今日のこの参加アーティストというのは、まあ、3人、3組ともですね、あの、まあ、メディアアートのアーティストなんですけれども、まあ、といってもメディアアートといってもかなり表現の幅広くて、しかも今日のタイトルとなっているメディアスラッシュインターネットというのは、まあ、非常に、あの、こうそ、それだけでは何のお話か全然想像できないような、ちょっとミステリアスな、あの、タイトルにな、タイトルになってますし、あの、メディア、そしてインターネットということ、それぞれが、あの、指し示す範囲も、まあ、非常に大きいので、まあ、少しちょっとその言葉について、あの、もう少し解説と言いますか、解体してみようというふうに思います。So, um... Um, so my path to go through this, uh, through this dense um, structure of different, different issues that are, uh, you know, encoded in the title of our talk is to, um, to look at what the, um, all the artists are unveiling um, and uh, in some cases visual, visualizing um, or, um, you know, making some um, hidden phenomena um, um, uh, visible. So they, they uh, I think that's a, that's a common denominator in all, uh, in case of all uh, the three artists and they work. Mm -hmm. でまず、この、まあ、非常に、まあ、難解なとも言えますし、あの、複雑なこの言葉の中でも、あの、今日、えー、登場いただく3組のアーティストたちが、まあ、共通していることは何かっていう,いうと、まあ、何かの、こう、見えなくなっている問題ですとか、あの、まあ、人が気づかないようなところ、えー、もしくは、あの、まあ、そこにあるのかどうかわからないようなものというのを、えー、こうベールを剥がすような感じで可視化しているというのがその作品を通じてそういった見えなくなっているような現象を見えるようにするというのがこの3組に共通する、まあ、アーティストとしての試みかなと思います。So, Johanna, uh, Johanna Moll,、uh, she,、um, she, she's an artist working with code, with programming, with software, and she, let's say, unveils、um, the, the infrastructure of, of, of the internet, the materiality of the internet, and all 
um, different hidden protocols and procedures, um, and also, you know, the power relations uh, between them. So that's what she brings to, um, to a daylight. 例えば、ジョアナ・モールの作品で言いますと、まあ、彼女はあの、まあこうえーまあ、パソコンのコンピューターの、まあ、コードとかプログラミングですとか、まあ、そういったものを扱って作品を作るんですけれども、あのまあ、彼女が何をこう明らかにするかというと、あのまあそえー、そういったインターネット上の、まあ、オンラインのインフラですね。そのインターネットの物質性っていうのを考えたときに、まあ、そこにどのようなインフラがあって、でそこにはどのようなまあ隠されたこうプロトコルですとか、あの隠されたこう情報というのがあって、でそのこう情報の格差やあの、まあ、アクセスのまあ、しやすさみたいなことから生まれる、こう、権力構造についても触れていて、まあ、そういったことを作品を通して明らかにしていくというのが彼女の、えー、まあ、何かを可視化するという試みだと思います。はい。シャーロット・アイフレル、シー・ワークス・ウィッド・デ・ミディオン・オブ・ビディオ、ウィッド・ムービング・イメージ、アンシー、ウ especially interested in what she calls politics of representation, which is another hidden structure, kind of, you know, uh, um, semantic structure, but also a structure of, you know, how do we um, deal um, with art history and art practice in the context of, uh, um, of uh, yeah, f- f- feminist philosophy. Charlotte Eiffler uh, f- for sure uh, you know, starts from feminist position and she unveils all these you know, hidden structures that um, result with what we see, uh, how we see certain uh, personas and phenomena. On the screen. So she's interested in that and,、uh, and to visualize these hidden structures,、um, she uses a, a very special,、uh, I would say, visual language that combines fiction and,、uh, and also a documentary、um, or documental approach.、Mm-hmm. シャーロッテ・アイフラーさんというのは、あの、ビデオ、映像を、あの、の作品が中心になるんですけれども、あの、まあ、彼女が扱っているものは、その表彰、リプレゼンテーションというものの、えー、ポリティクスということになります。ですので、あの、まあ、表彰の、えー、表彰っていうことにおける政治的な関係性というのが、まあ、どういったところにあるのかということを明らかにしていて、まあ、そこから、そこには、あの、え、美術史ですとか、あの、アートの、こう、あの、実践ということが介入してくるんですけれども、もう少し、あの、まあ、彼女の、えー、思考というのを支えているのが、もう一つは、えー、フェミニス、まあ、フェミニズムでありまして、このフェミニズ、フェミニズム的な思考ですとかアプローチというのも彼女の作品については重要になってきます。で彼女がそこでそういったことを通じて明らかにしていくのは、まあ、スクリーン上に現れるいろいろなこうペルソナというあの、まあ、スクリーン上に現れる存在というものがあのどういう存在なのかということをこう構造として明らかにしたりですとか、まあ、そこにあのそこにはこう彼女の視覚的な言語としてえ、フィクションやドキュメンタリーの手法が取り入れられて、まあ、それが全体的に作品として消化されてもえ、そういったあの、まあ、インターネットスクリーンに現れてくる、えーまあ、フェミニスト的な視点から見つめた、まあ、表彰されるっていうことの文化というのがどういうものになっているのかということが明らかにされていくという作品です。Finally,、uh, Caro and Nico,、um, they,、um, they actually you know, work、um, with, uh, within the genre of installation, of kinetic installation. They build robotic structures, but very kind of simple one,、uh, ones,、uh, because they, what are they interested in is the very, let's say, like the DNA of any media art, which is the Electric current and electricity. So they are interested in the very basis 
um, of, or, or, you know, one important uh, area that was one of the, let's say, formatting um, uh, movements in art, formatting for media art, and I mean um, kinetic art. So they, they, they really practice kinetic art, but they work uh, with, you know, electric current. So what they unveil is like the, the, the I would say the roots, you know, of, um, of all the devices, technological devices that surround us. And um, yeah, and with their presentation, we will start today's talk. そして最後にですね、えーえーお、あの二人のユニットとして活動しています、えー、キャロラインさんとニコラスさんなんですけれども、まあ、彼らが作っているのは、あのまあ、いわゆるキネティックインスタレーションというふうに呼べるもので、あのまあ、動く、えー、彫刻、動く、まあまあ、動くあの作品を作って、それがまあインスタレーションとして現れてくるというものが多くあります。ただ、その動く彫刻といっても、かなりあの構造としてはシンプルなものにとどめて、まあ、そこであのいろいろな、えー、仕掛けを見せていくという作品なんですけれども、まあ、あのこのキネティックインスタレーションもしくはキネティックなものを扱うというのは、まあ、メディアアートの中では、まああのフ,ォームフォーマットとしてかなり重要なあの表現の仕方なんですけれどもその中でもこう、まあ、電気回路がどうなっているかっていうことを利用した作品ですとか、まあ、そういうそのテクノロジー今、まあ、私たちがさまざまに使っているテクノロジーの、まあ、元となるような基礎となるようなところにある、まあ、その電気の動きだとか回路というものがえどういうふうなあの力を持っているのかとかとどういうふうな影響を私たちに与えているのかというその根っこの部分ですねまさにルーツの部分を扱っている作家だなというふうに思います。Yeah, thank you, uh, dear Kanoko, for uh, um, translating this introduction. We thought it would be vital to have this introduction translated in Japanese.、Mm -hmm. Now we will,、uh, as we will connect、uh, right away、um, to、uh, Caroline and Nicolas in Offenbach,、mm -hmm. uh, we will switch to completely English uh, um, um, version of, 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 of our talk. Yes.、Yeah. So, all for you. <laughs> so, I hope everyone enjoys the talk and all the artists.、Um, yeah, please enjoy this moment. Okay, thank you so, so much.、Oh. Hello. 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 Here they are. Yeah. <laughs> Here they are. Hey, welcome. <laughs> welcome. And <laughs>、um, yeah. Uh, well, before I ask you this one question, um, uh, um, And before you start your presentation, I would like to make sure that、um, I like to ask every artist, like everyone、uh, being part of this talk, some of us are waiting in the backstage. But all of them should, should really listen carefully because I would like each of you to ask one question to your colleague from the, from the talking round. So,、um, Yeah, while、uh, Caroline and Nicolas will、uh, just start the presentation,、uh, yeah, Charlotte and, and、uh, Joanna have to listen carefully to what they say. So, just as I told already in, in my introduction, for, for me, what is、uh, so interesting, so really exciting about your art practice is that you go. Like to the deepest possible, you know, root of media art because you deal with electricity and with this kind of, I would say, both a very rational, like engineering like approach and this,、uh, you know, artistic one when, when, when the creatures you,、um, you、uh, construct,、uh, you know, are, are starting to behave like some. Sort of living beings.、Yeah. Um, so, this is for sure not、uh, uh, you know, any kind of、um, robotics that includes uh, uh, machine learning systems or the, you know, the, the holy grail of today's、uh, advanced technology,、um, uh, artificial intelligence. Yet,、uh, those very simple creations 
um, you know, uh, serve as a kind of uh, mirror for us humans. <laughs> uh, so in, in case of your work, you really look at, at your installations and you learn something about, um, about uh, yeah, how we humans act. Could you please uh, agree or disagree <laughs> with me and, and uh, tell if, if that is true, what you are interested in? The floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, and we are totally agree with you. <laughs> so, um, as you say, mentioned, we, we built uh, robots as robots as, as artworks, and uh, one of our first works was Vincent and Emily, and this one we wanted to show in uh, Sapporo. And this is a robotic couple, and they uh, try to find each other and try to communicate with the, with the other robot or with the um, um, visitors. And we thought that they have a lot of different layers that uh, until um, from the electric current to the how we see electric uh, things, how we see technology things and what we project in it. And we thought maybe uh, because this work is like almost 10 years old when the first concept was made. And after that, we, we did a lot of research works with all of these layers, with all of these topics. And now for this presentation, we uh, wanted to pick three, uh, we, we picked three uh, newer works from us. And we think that every of these works has some layers of Vincent and Emily, which, where, where they go more in this research thing to, to see what the layers are. So, yeah, and we will show this in two examples. So we will um, show to you two, uh, three other works of our arts that we did. And the first one we will start with is called Lineas. It is um, a work we developed in 2018. And this is, um, as you said, um, we are making the DNA of um, technology. And maybe this is the one that is most close to this DNA thing. Um, there's a short clip where you can see the movement how um, two or three metal wires are winding around each other or um, yeah, how they are dancing maybe with each other. And um, what we wanted to um, show or how we wanted to get to the really core of current in this one was to have as less material as possible, but um, make the presence of current when it's running through the wires visible and um, the question was how we can, um, how we deal with th this perception that we normally don't have, because with human senses you cannot feel it usually, and yeah, this is a form of expression how how we can maybe feel the current, and um, because we think that most of the time you realize current was there when it is gone, so you miss it when the device is off, but you don't think about it when it's really there. That's a bad point, yeah. <laughs> and it's also with our project. So every uh, when, when the current is going off, all our projects are like dead. <laughs> and right, so this is also a topic we have to deal with. Yeah, and uh, so the next uh, project, uh, okay, this is Linias again. So like check the picture. And so this is the next one, it's an echo entity. And it's a coil, basically it's a magnetic coil that's also moving. I think it's hard to see, but it has little movements and really creepy ones because you don't know exactly why it moves, what it, what is it? And that is the second point. So there's also the layer of uh, electricity, but there's also this, this layer of movement, what we expect from movement in robotics. And of course, with linears, you can say, okay, it's it's okay that there's movement because it's beautiful. You can just look at it. That's, there's the reason why it has to move. But on this this piece, you look at it and you think, hmm, what is that? Is this an organ, a muscle, a worm, some kind of uh, movement studies? So the, the movement itself, it's not that clear. And you don't know why or how it moves and what's the right way to move. And it's a layer where you see how 
how much you interpret and how much you want from technology to be. And maybe there's a break that you see, oh, I saw there's a firework of movement, but there's like nothing at all or sometimes something. And what what does it tell me to my own uh, expectation of technological movements and and to what the current to do to this material. So this is uh, one, it's amplified entity. It's a bigger, um, bigger object, but it's basically the same with uh, echo entity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's the exposition uh, in the National Museum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so sadly, that this one is gone, so we have now smaller ones. <laughs> OK. okay. Um, yeah, the, the, if I may inter interrupt here for a moment, because I had these thoughts that, you know, uh, you told that the, these two works for sure show what we expect from robotics in terms of movement and how we how we perceive this movement. I, I have to say that this uh, eco entity and the multiply entity, the, the, the bigger version uh, that we see uh, right now, uh, it was it was a really uncanny feeling in the terms that like it, it really resembled resembled a natural a very basic movement and this is this uh, this feeling when something technological and artificial is so really very close to humans it creates this feeling of of you know of being in this uncanny valley and i had this feeling in you know in case of of of, of this you know coil made of, of <laughs> wire which is kind of strange but but uh yeah, because it's basically uh, so technical so because it's only like metal and that's it <laughs> so, yeah. yeah but then you realize that your muscles w work you know in the same way with electricity so that was you know how i realized okay you know what we see here it, 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 you know the same thing happens uh, in in my muscles when i move them it's you know all small electrical uh, uh, yeah the, the the flow of small electrical current uh, that happens uh, all the time inside our body. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, we think with this one, it um, works um, so well because it's uh, like we take something from the micro space of um, bodies to, to a macroscopic space and we don't have a vision of, or we don't know how it looks like inside of us. So we tend to um, uh, yeah see this in the technical creature because we it could look like that or or we um, we use the wires to look a little bit like umbilical cords. As you see, there's those um, copper wires in a um, milky and transparent uh, jelly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this is uh, yeah something we try to um, to make this a bit similar, but not really. But you tend to um, compare it. And with this one, you you can match it because with Vincent and Emily, you can also look for. Um, things that are not similar to humans, but with this one, it's hard. If it's just an organ, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's technically and alive at the same time somehow. And um, so we go to the next work. It's a um, group called Siblings. Um, they are very tiny robots. They are only f five centimeters in height, and they are a big group, all called Siblings. And as you see in the video, there's a little number for each sibling. So this is their uh, birthday. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we, with the title, it's already a little family of robots. And how they are moving is um, maybe a little bit uh, stupid and funny and not really, um, they are very dysfunctional and shaky. And this makes them uh, already a little bit human because they are not perfect and they don't have a purpose. They are or just the family that is everyone is their own personality somehow. And this adds um, a social layer, which um, hides the electricity already a bit more. Because um, with those robots, you, you see all the electronics also. If you look at- I think in the next picture, you can ah, yeah. see it better. Maybe, ah, maybe, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, um, because they have uh, like um, hair or something on top of their body that is the sensor and the transistor. So this is the electrical circuit that is actually running them. And um, you see now there are black cups um, next to them. They usually live under those cups and visitors can lift them. And then if light hits the sensors of the robots, they run away like insects that are under a stone and <laughs> want to hide from the sunlight. And um, yeah, it's funny because you already, you the, we still show the electrical parts, but um, visitors and also we tend to not um, see them anymore or to not focus on them. We focus on the interaction with them and their personality. Yeah, so uh, you just used the word the family of robots, which of course brings us to the you know father of media art, Nam Jun Paik, he created. <laughs> It's uh, uh, for, for quite a few decades, the, 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 the big cycle family of robots, which back then in the 1980s and 90s uh, was using the old cabinets of TVs and radios from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. So um, in a way he created, um, you know, just this projection of our technological based technologically based society that was very um let's say into television television was back then this new medium um that uh, that was so important for us uh, and th that is why you know those pikes robots were so huge and so monumental and i think you know this kind of uh socially <laughs> engaged um, tiny creatures that you know are shaken <laughs> um, with the different possibilities they they don't really you know even realize they uh, they uh, they have them right yeah. um, it, it is a kind of uh, maybe group portray of today's uh, <laughs> you know, society. <laughs> how nothing is so monumental as television anymore yet uh, I think technology permeates like all areas of our life and, and it's important to understand you know that there are those electrons uh, you know those particles the, the basic particles um, that make uh, all the technology running and just as you mentioned correctly we uh, spot, we perceive uh, the electricity when it's gone. And I yeah. think this is, you know, kind of um, perspective coming closer and closer to us as, as humanity that, you know, at some point, if we don't change our way of life, the electricity will be gone. And, you know, that, that <laughs> it will be basically it, you know. Yeah. As, as soon as the, you know, maybe small photovoltaic cells, you know, on those little robots who will function, we will just, you know, behave like them as a society, but basically. Yeah, but, but right, because today's uh, technologic things are so small, so like you don't need to be monument anymore because it, it's smart and small and you don't recognize it. It's getting invisible. And I think this is one of the big problems that all, all the things they are influence us so much are getting invisible because you don't recognize it anymore because there are so many layers over on top of, of the basic technical stuff that you accept it like it is. And you like only... you know take it for for granted yeah. uh, whereas it's really important to understand how the whole thing you know works so maybe even you know those nano and micro scale solutions uh, yeah. you know and if they are smart I'm, I'm really you know scared if i hear the word smart they are probably <laughs> even more hostile and more I would say just you know more complex than the technology that used to be so monumental at, and used to be you know mm -hmm. packed in some you know wooden cabinets. Uh, uh, yeah, that that's that's for sure the style of of, of nowadays. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I I think um, it was a, a really. Uh, 
great introduction in all the other hidden layers that you are interested in. And indeed, Vincent and Emily is in a in a way your more complex work. Yeah, we <laughs> thought that that Vincent and Emily have all these layers, but it's of course hard to tell because when you see it, it you, they have so many things that the names, the personality they get through the names that it's a pair how yeah. they act and to this interaction thing so but also you see the layers because you there is no hidden technology is oh, everything is visible exposed and, yeah yeah, yeah. And, we we encourage all the viewers to go to you know we have the, the the two great websites and the artist interviews and yeah we have prepared lots of documentation about the projects that we were uh, planning to show at SIAF 2020 thanks Carol and Nicolas and now I would like to um uh, ask uh, Charlotte Eiffler to join thank you us thank you you stay with us of course yeah, <laughs> yeah and charlotte is joining uh, she's still muted we need her hello hey. charlotte hello hey. hello <laughs> yeah hello from leipzig uh how is the weather there it's snowy same as yours it's uh... good yeah so it's good to stay at home in the morning and talk a little bit about art exactly. <laughs> well i already made the, the the we already made a brief introduction into your art practice we are um actually you know trying to to focus on uh what you are all unveiling <laughs> within your art practice when it comes to this huge package you know titled media slash internet it's of course a monster but you deal with some certain aspect of 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 this monster of this construction and you try to deconstruct certain patterns so i would like you to um explain a little bit um if uh you know this is true i'm guessing here and uh yeah what is actually you know politics of representation how shall uh, like a you know normal person understands understands this um this phenomenon how to deal with that yeah thank you agnieszka for introducing and uh also mentioning this uh, being born in a country which doesn't exist anymore it influenced me a lot, uh, by the way. But um, yeah, so um, the topic of uh, representation, which is uh, which, it's a huge for me, um, if regarding images and their politics. So uh, what is shown and what is missing, and I'm I'm really interested in the um, intertwinement of representation with technology so how do certain technological devices or programs or surfaces manifest hierarchical forms of visibility so what do they produce show or which image data is extracted evaluated and visualized for which purpose which often leads to the entanglement in the history of military technology and art and um, yeah, I did some some works about those entanglements, uh, which I find quite interesting because also um, technology and art, military share a common language um, often, also or like at least in in the sense of the moving image. Yeah. So um, the first work, yeah, uh, which I would like to share with you is uh, modes of abstraction which uh, questions who gets uh, abstracted and uh, who has the power to control processes of abstraction, which involve always types of categorization. And in the end, it follows the approach towards abstraction in military and in science and art slash art. So what are the, um, the similarities in those approaches? You can maybe um, Nishi, maybe we can go some slides forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are all belong to um, to this work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was actually at um, um, at the European Military Congress uh, in Berlin, where everyone was presenting their new technology to for surveillance systems. So 
so I talked to some people over there. And the next one would be women feeding machines. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, where a woman speaks um, to the historic space towards switchboard operators from the beginning of the 20th century. So it's about emotional labor at the interface of technology, effects, and knowledge. And I did it together with Hugh Hang. Yeah, it's a video. And the next one would be a film. Ah, oh, yeah, we see still women feeding machines. Yeah, there it is. It's a set of non-computable things. The next one, the woman with, who's smoking a tampon. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, a set in a fictional setting uh, where two trainees practice exercises of non-computability within a training camp of a visual resistance group. So they try to not to get tracked, evaluated um, by the surveillance around them. And they do it in a very old school and sloppy way. So they would put stones in their shoes and try to sleep everywhere to not send out data. The, the stones they put in their shoes to change their walking patterns, very old school. Uh, or they try to pee differently to not be categorized as either female or male, for example. So yeah, this mm -hmm, this is the work. It it has two parts, and another work, plant estate, which is also set in in the future. And I did with Thomas Mader is about bioengineering, which has created unlimited memory for all information by then. So the cloud has been replaced by data storage in plant tissue, and this use of this of this new system um, of data storage uh, has fundamentally changed the accessibility, transmission and securing of knowledge. So we questioned how, how is knowledge transferred when, when it's in plants and not longer in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, and there's also a current work involved, uh, which is on the, which you see on the next slide. Uh, by now, it's called Archival Grid, and I'm working together on it with the filmmaker Clarissa Tima, and it will be a multi-channel installation. And this first part, where you, which you see now, uh, focuses on mapping and geographic surveying as an instrument of war. But in general, the work is about the politics of archives and how that influences collective memory strategies, especially in relation to war and trauma. And in this, in this context, the questions arises of how the past and the present are archived, the archive as a political instrument for visibility, which is totally linked to power structures that decide what is qualified to be kept and what is not. So yeah, um, maybe this is a, a good link to this to the work I, I showed I would have shown at CF, which also started off with an archive. Um, this is the work Feminism is a Browser. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nishi. Um, and there I introduced the figure of a cyber entity as an archive themselves. So an archive that is not read as a place, but rather as a collective figure. And the cyber entity, which we see over there, is called Yeva and has access to the email archive of a feminist international network of hackers, cyberpunks, media artists, activists, digital researchers. And this network is called FACES and was founded in 1997. So it's not a fiction, it really <laughs> does exist. And it was founded with the purpose of connecting and supporting self-identified women working with technology. And most of those members started to work with or about digital technology already in the 70s when video came up and then begin to mess around with the possibilities of the internet and online platforms. So um, yeah, they are true um, media pioneers and have so much knowledge to learn from. And I wanted to, to make that stories visible and create a space. Um, yeah, and that's why uh, I started this project. Um, but I had this, this big questions like not to become an archive again, because 
the problem with archives is they're not really feeling alive often. I mean, it depends. Um, and that's why I brought in the cyber entity Yeva, um, who you could say I kind of foisted a daughter on the network in the form of the cyber entity. And in my narration, this character Yeva was created by this very network in the 90s and is raised on the internet. And Yeva wants to know how the utopia, utopias of the 90s did transform and how the next generation can follow up. So Yeva decides to leave their web space and find their so-called mothers in the physical world. And with every encounter, Yeva changes and becomes more and more this archive of female media pioneers. If we switch a bit the slides, you, um, yeah, the next one you can see some. And there's also, so Yeva also really asked and meets um, uh, the members of this network faces. In this case, it's Jenny Maketu and Diana McCarty. And talks uh, about the internet technology and the metri materiality of the internet, which is, I guess, uh, the topic of uh, Johan. <laughs> a big one yeah so in that sense you know i i think we understood what what it really means to work with politics of representation because this is the, the very yeah probably this is really the right uh, uh, expression for for this uh, for this multi-layered structure of different narratives histories um uh, intertwined with yeah entanglement is also the the the, the right word because this an entanglement be between the media uh, developing media industries and the warfare in in general is uh, it's like also something that is encrypted in all the technology but we forget it yeah, I know. Think of it. So you know, the, the the politics of representation would be, for instance, you know, to ask question why, um, you know, don't we all know how the GPS system was created? You know, why don't we uh, really understand? You know, or or just at least want to know how. I don't know CIA or secret services, you know, funded companies were part of all the early developments, you know, bought some startups and mingled with all the, you know, big, um, big companies, um, technological uh, tycoons. So it's a big, uh, you know, issue. It's it's not only today, but if if you think of you know, the, 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 the history of how, you know, the Macy conferences, you know, how all this, this uh, technological apparatus, this big industry was from the very beginning also working with artists, uh, you know, artists were uh, for sure among them or media artists uh, who really questioned these early developments. But now, uh, you know, the politics of representation means to ask the question why when you know what is covered what is being covered now and it relates to different issues also to the uh, to the notion of of women artists and activists within the the, the 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 history of not only media art but history of art and development of technology so yeah so the all the women working you know manually <laughs> connecting the calls i think that's a, that's a great uh, the image you you showed a screenshot from uh from from your video also shows how uh you know how much women labor was connected <laughs> with cre creation of of certain uh, technologies that uh we as human humanity really rely on. So I also like a lot the structure of 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 your video um, of your work that we aimed to show at, at Sapporo, uh, feminism as a browser, be because it, you know it not only does um, question a certain. Uh, historical structure you know certain archives and certain developments like historical facts but also it you know it creates this archive so it's uh, you know it adds this critical uh, uh, 
um, this critical layer to uh, to um, you know to just ask questions. Why actually are there so so or the the women that co-created you know the, the the rising internet the technology you know since yeah. since the early 70s as you say why are, are they not so much visible there's also i i read an an email today with where um, an artist uh, judy Brodsky, she uh she said she will publish a book in the um, this year about the about the history of feminist movements and how they shape digital technology and and she was asking uh, in this um, network if if anybody knows if this would be the first book about it because she has no references and i mean this tells so much that this this is 2021 it would be the first book about uh, feminism shaping the digital so um yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's well, like, weird. There are books right now, but like, um, yeah, so that, 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 that's that's for sure. You know, this uh, emancipatory movement uh, is, of course, connected with researching the history and the fact that you know, uh, like the new wave of uh, of researchers working across humanities and technology, they are started to be interested in those forgotten narratives and those you know, past that were, you know, uh, there was there was never, you know, like uh, this mainstream, this one path of developments in art and, and culture. So there are always, you know, uh, like many, many different ways and paths uh, that come together, you know, to join at some moment. But it's it's surely interest that, interesting that it is happening now, so across media and internet, there are uh, also those uh, power structures uh, that that serve a certain politics, uh, and this politics is a matter of convention. So we, <laughs> in order to change it, we have first to to understand that it is out there, and yeah. at least think always like twice what is underneath. Totally, um, like to, to to unpack those uh, black boxes. I think that's or to to find a visual language also for it because it's as as with the cloud as a symbol for internet, which which is designed by by someone, but it's yeah. just um, yeah one symbol or one side or one story yeah. of what it uh, means to work yeah. with uh, internet. So, so so your proposal to you know have an unlimited data storage in plants it's uh, you know uh, it's very revolutionary i i like this much much more yeah, there is the, i mean it's in in, uh, in this case it's a fiction but there is actually sure. uh, i think a little team oh, i forgot if they are at the um mit or not but uh who's who's working on putting putting data into plants and um i think this is really interesting what what does it mean if um, all our information were, were stored in plants? Yeah, if they really, are, yeah, really yes. all this, and, you know, not like uh, the, the the claim of Wikipedia once, you know, revolutionary was to bring all the knowledge of the entire world to all the humans, which also proves to, you know, not be happening due to certain politics of representation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that is maybe a, a good example of of how, uh, you know, this flow of, of of information. This this also what you said that the pro production of knowledge, you know, transfer of knowledge. How how. How heavily it is controlled and and being kept closed, which is uh, which is a paradox when you think of you know what were the ideas of the early internet pioneers mm -hmm. and how you know uh, how it was dreamt to 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 you know possibly change the world in some some nice way. Uh, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. We are coming closer and closer to the, you know, hard stuff, to the, uh, <laughs> you know, r really the, the hardcore materiality of, of Internet in terms of, of code. Uh, um, 
being uh, being a, yeah one of the biggest secrets nowadays. I guess the 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 source code of um, of many services that we use today. And uh, Joanna Moll is um, is an artist working with code. Hello, Joanna. Hello. <laughs> Hola. You're in Barcelona, right? Yeah. Yeah. What else? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Welcome. So we we just came to 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 the point when in our discussion, yeah, we just have to 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 ask you, um, you know, how uh, what what exactly it is this you know um, materiality of internet of the infrastructure of the internet. Uh, Charlotte already. Uh, uh, you you know uh, referred to the metaphor of the name of cloud as a symbol for for this uh, excessive <laughs> excessive computing. Uh, but w what is you know exactly interesting also for you as an artist working with code within this you know part of of the media art field. Well, I think that it's really important to understand how things work in order to, un to to be able to truly understand what they are or, or to be able to articulate any narrative that goes with them because otherwise you're very very much lost and even though even if you code even if you understand how um, infrastructures work and so on it, it, it's still like a huge black box and you don't understand what you're actually seeing so I think it's just not opening the black box in a way. It's also to understand how to understand the black box, right? Because I think that the that the problem, uh, and I'm going to exemplify this in the project that I'm going to explain here, it's that even though you can open all this code and you understand how much code is being uh, used uh, by doing any thing that you can do online or that's articulating any process, you aren't able to understand it. Um, and that's a massive problem, right? Because I think it's very frustrating when you open the black box and the black box, it's still a black box, you know? <laughs> and, and well, it's complicated. We'll talk about it later. Um, so here I'm going to talk about the project I, I was supposed to show live in a CF. I mean, I'm showing it live, but physically. Um, <laughs> And, and it's called the hidden life of uh, the Amazon user. So everything started when I bought this book that you can see here in the pictures, but I also have it here, which is called The Life Lessons and Rules for Success. Uh, and it has a very long subtitle, which is called The Journey, The Teachable Moments, and 10 Rules for Success, cultivated from the life and wisdom of Jeff Bezos. <laughs> it's, and it's a great uh, title, it's so long, but then the book is just, this tiny, right? And I was very surprised because when I bought it online, I thought that it would be like a book. Yeah, and uh, also the brochure, the, the phone <laughs> size. Yeah, it's like a brochure. It's it's very big, so it's really there is really not a lot of uh, information Content. here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not a lot. I mean, one of his best uh, advice is like, uh, please sleep eight hours a day. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. Because nobody's Good. doing this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, so the project, uh, it's based in this book. So I put this book and what I did, I traced or I tracked all the interfaces that I needed to go through Amazon, of course, to buy this book. So it just took me with the minimum amount of steps required, which I uh, rehearsed it several times, you know, just not to get distracted by some buttons here, some images there, and then click to some suggestions here and there. I just stick to the thing. So Jeff Bezos, the book, I'm going to order it and I'm going to buy it. That's it. So it took 12 interfaces, 12 different interfaces, which is, I think it's quite a lot still to go straight to the point. Yeah, because meanwhile you are buying, there is a lot of different suggestions that are being uh, brought to you. Yeah? Uh, they suggested me to buy books by Elon Musk, and then by uh, Steve Jobs and the likes. At the end of the purchase, they suggested me Michelle Obama. It was the only woman that was suggested to me, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so together with uh, these 12 interfaces, which I thought that it was already a lot, 
uh, I also measured the amount of code that was downloaded in my computer. Yeah, because uh, this Julian Oliver wants to explain it very beautifully. It's not that you go to the website, the website comes to you. Yeah, the website, all the websites that we see are being downloaded in our computer. And it's very important to, uh, to understand this. Yeah? Uh, so it was a total of 80 megabytes of code, a little bit more, which equal to nine to 10,000 pages of printed code. So you can see it here, right, um, in this picture. This was an exhibition uh, at Halle. Uh, this is how it was supposed to look at the uh, CF, a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, I was trying to do it a bit more sophisticated, but that's it. So that's massive, right? And then you can connect to this tower of code, and then you can understand like uh, the materiality of it's all this. these it's processes. This is it, Sorry? yeah. Yeah, I this, mean, this is, is okay. the materiality, just you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's a way to uh, represent it, right? I mean, as uh, well, we talk about uh, it with Charlotte quite uh, quite a lot before, but it's just a representation. But it's a representation that we can sort of um, understand or apprehend, <laughs> yeah, as humans. And 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 I think that was very important to represent that. And also the website that I did for the project, which uh, well, you can show it if you want. So what I did, I just added like the first interface, then all the code that was downloaded uh, after the first interface, second interface code, third interface code. So if you scroll it down, uh, which you can do it online, uh, religiously, like, you know, like the proper way, not tricking a computer or anything, it's 14 minutes, 14 to 15 minutes of scroll, which is a lot also, yeah? And then you, you can understand like if this code could, it could be displayed in other ways, you could understand how heavy it is and how energy intensive it is. So the project, what it really tried to reveal was not only uh, how the user is being exploited by means of free labor, which is a very recurrent theme in my uh, work as well. Um, it means that basically when you interact online, all these companies are just sucking a lot of information derived from uh, user interaction or user activity, such as the clicks that you do, the movement of the mouse, uh, the way you type, like typing patterns when you use your keyboard, the browser that you're using, the computer that you're using, the referral websites, and a lot of different things. For example, Google Analytics, which is one of the, it's basically the most tracking cookie used. It can track up to 200 points of information of a single user. It's crazy. It's insane. Wow. You know? So that's what basically, uh, uh, extracting user activity means, yeah? There is a lot of things that are referred to a single user and then you can do patterns of behavior and and get like a more accurate uh, understanding of the user and serve um, <laughs> prepared or pre-designed uh, experiences specifically for this user, yeah? So uh, free labor comes to this because this also generates a lot of revenues for the, the companies. Uh, I mean, so this, this, this is yeah this is the basis of the you know of the, um, the business plan so it is, it you is. Know, we are part of that you know the, of that business plan yeah, yeah, whereas we think we we get some uh, services for free <laughs> indeed no no but but they are not i mean at the end of the day they are not and it's very hard to understand sure. how these processes work because also they change very rapidly and um well so in this project, because I explored this in my work uh, quite extensively, so I wanted to go a little bit further. So it doesn't just talk about the exploitation of the user by means of free labor, it's what I explained, but also the user needs to assume part of the energy uh, needed to uh, carry out these processes that ultimately do not benefit you, but uh, I mean, in terms of, I want to want to speak economically, but they benefit those companies, yeah? yeah. And this, it's an approach that we don't we don't tend to see things like this. And when I was talking about black boxes and black boxes, it's like because the site, we have to redirect the site to places that matter. And this is really important because when you attract hundred times a day, thousands of times a month, and hundreds of thousands a year, the amount of energy that you have to assume along with its environmental impacts, which you cannot negotiate, 
it's massive. Mm. It's massive, yeah. And companies should be held accountable for this. I'm working in a project that works uh, in this direction uh, in a much more deep way. But uh, I'm going to release it, I hope, at the end of the year, hopefully. I remember you, you mentioned this new secret uh, project that uh, uh, shall go one step further and in not only visualize uh, and make, make those uh, hidden procedures and, you know, all those different materialities visible, but also be, uh, in, uh, like, be more active or effective. So I'm yeah. really curious. <laughs> I know it's well, a complex, complex, it, complex thing. It is, it is very, very much. Uh, so I'm doing my best, but it's very complex because once you want to do something else and visualize, things get very tricky. <laughs> So I'm struggling a bit, but uh, well, I hope um, I hope I'll succeed. So yeah, uh, I, I, that's, that's a project. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you you messed up with the you know the the richest man on the planet uh, in in uh, in the uh, secret life of an Amazon user in this work, you know, uh, and it was kind of. Um, Ironic, yeah, ironically, to look, you know, at, at how how Amazon uh, really, you know, using all these all the labor done by uh, by you know the the let's say customers, uh, also their resources are made. Who pays the energy bill uh, at at the end of the day? It, it, it's the user, of course, and how you know. Uh, basing on the system during the, the pandemic lockdowns, how insanely rich, you know, <laughs> this company became. So, um, and, and you really see how all these systems and materialities, because I, I would claim there are lots of the different materialities of internet, right? So, yeah, yeah, so, so they, they manifest themselves like, you know, you have on one hand this pile of pages with with printed code uh, of you know so, something that you not really consciously deal with when when you buy something out there and you can like really you know be there with your body in a certain space and, and, and measure yourself with that pile of book i think you know this uh, of pages i think this pile of pages is really something a very powerful experience to 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 uh, to your body like really you know you have this one materiality but there are all, of course all the you know all these heavy in infrastructures i i mean all these server farms you know where are they you know what uh, i mean it's um it's just uh different kinds of materialities uh, that are so much, so heavily interconnected. Uh, yeah. I so, mean, the internet is probably the biggest infrastructure that was ever built, you know, in the history of humanity. And um, it's just super complex and there is so many things that uh, rely on the internet and, and that build the internet and make it function. And um, one of the most contradictory things when it comes to sustainable energy of those internet companies it comes when they say that they are running 100% renewables, uh, which it might happen inside their companies, but the internet and their services, they're not just operating in their infrastructures. They need the whole internet, which means they may need our, so our devices, our computers, our keyboards, our everything. <laughs> yeah. So it's like how, how, how can this be renewable? Um, it's a huge fallacy and uh, policy making should really be looking into this because I think it's a crime that they can uh, self-proclaim themselves as a renewable energy, uh, that they're running renewable uh, energy companies or yeah, sustainable companies. Yeah, in a way, we are at the same point uh, of time when uh, I think, like you know, in nineteenth century, when uh, uh, child children labor was something. Of obvious you know because there was no uh, no law regulating uh, 
you know, these issues. And it was just obvious, okay, either the kid goes to school if the parents can, uh, you know, send him or her to school, or, you know, there is work and seven days a week, 12 hours a day, you know, in, 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 uh, because it was possible, because it was not regulated. And the same situation is now with all those uh, companies that have the keys to those black boxes. And I, I don't know, slowly, uh, as far as I am uh, informed about, you know, the work of artists dealing with these issues, I, you know, I become more and more scared that they might have, you know, the key to these black boxes, but they they forgot themselves you know what they packed in so that yeah. might be kind of you know scary there is, situation there is one thing it's called legacy code which i didn't know it had this name a friend told me recently um which is like all these uh, for example google uh, the the engine right it just built over so many layers of code and code that was built so many years ago that nobody understand what it's doing anymore Right, so uh, there is also like this risk of losing control over the machines that take decisions uh, that affect millions of people, uh, not even every day, it's every second. Every yeah? second, yeah. And, so we, and that's very problematic. So we really need a new uh, legal system to respond to, to, you know, to these new possibilities and challenges because uh, like, yeah, one have to imagine that the whole, you know, the 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 the, the whole world is turning on this one, uh, on this you know prevailing or using this prevailing business model um, that is you know totally uh, untransparent, non-controllable, and we are at the dawn of you know artificial intelligence, where exactly the Google uh, learning mechanisms, you know, they they already you know manage to like the the code is capable of writing you know a few lines of new code and this is you you know we we are not even able to trace all the changes in in the in the code that were made by humans in the last yeah the 25 or 30 years of the the history of uh expanding internet and and uh um technology uh, but when you know this layer of artificial intelligence writing its own code comes into that, I, I guess there there might be some you know big mess ahead of us. Um, <laughs> so I'm I'm started uh, I'm starting to worry uh, you know more and more I I I, I, I guess. Well, thank you, thank you, Joanna. Um, at the beginning of our talk, I asked you all to to have a question uh, to the other participants of of this talk. We still have uh, something like half an hour, twenty few minutes. I just got information from the studio that we might extend our our uh, uh, stream uh, time. Uh, so, yeah, Caroline and Nicholas, uh, yeah, do you have a question and whom do you, would you like to ask from, from your colleagues in the panel? Um, okay, yeah, I, um, because we, I have a question for Joanna because we were just in this uh, topic and uh, for us uh, materialization I think is the thing we we mainly deal with and you you said that or oh, you're doing it with the code the, that you print and you put the code into a big um, bunch of paper and this is something we humans can uh, really fast connect to and and get a feeling of the mass of data and um, do you think that um, it is just too far developing so that we humans cannot keep track of all the code that is um, running there and um, that we need this materialization somehow to connect to because um, at the moment all this um, code that is running as you explained that it's, it's downloaded to our computers and we run it with electricity so there is somehow a materialization how, how we destroy the nature by producing all the electricity to do it, but we don't see this. 
Uh, sorry, it's a bit. Um, <laughs> idea, I think there is a materialization already, but we we it's not visible or we don't connect it. Um, and I like the idea of what you did with the paper. It is this very simple way of of having a materialization that we can connect to. Um, do you think this this could be something that can be helpful in the future, or we can adapt this to more of this in visual and digital life? Yeah. What, what to do? What would be the next, you know, the, the other logical step after, um, yeah, facing, you know, this pile of code? Uh, I mean, what, what it, it would be, you know, throw away your computer, never buy anything on the internet, you know. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think, well, there is many layers and it's a very tricky uh, question. Uh, <laughs> but I think the problem with the narratives that we are basically living our lives uh, society and uh, that do not allow us to see the heavy materiality of all the digital technologies or that anything that we do, we are super disconnected from nature. Um, but also that's deeply embedded in the in our society, in our mentality, and uh, it's something that, you know, there's a long tradition. I mean, it, even before the Enlightenment period, yeah, when the man was self-declared, like, the, that should reign over nature, over all things, because God, you know, um, whatever. And this is, it was even before medieval times. So I think, like, for me, like, if we have to go through the route, I think it's to start fighting this ideal that uh, men has to reign or has to have to control uh has like a divine control over nature just because it is you know uh and nature has to be um our slave in a way uh so uh, for me i think it's more i don't think it's a technical problem i think it's really like a narrative problem and we are just operating uh, throughout narratives that are very damaging and toxic uh, basically it's gonna kill us, they're gonna kill us eventually. <laughs> it's not, yeah. I mean, I went very far away, but I think that this is really not a technical problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. also to focus the danger to us, as we are slowly doing now with um, the climate change, something that really works with the bad narrative, but it, um, yeah, somehow slowly now starts to um, make people act uh, towards the future very late but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 but i feel like there is a fundamental narrative change that needs to happen and this is going to be very very hard yeah i mean leaving you know this anthropocentric path uh, and this anthropocentric position which is you know it's uh it's nice to be the king of you know <laughs> of the world but it's you know it's a stupid idea we 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 cannot uh, longer, you know, sit on that branch while suing it. So um, that's uh, that, that's uh, that's a good uh, that's a good uh, very important point here that we should not be distracted by all the you know like outputs of our of our doing uh, of our you know being active here. But we we always have to you know ask this the same questions like you know where is the place for us humans among all the living beings here on this planet you know what is really you know the the core of 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 our bonds to each other and to you know the whole uh, ecosystem um of of this very unique planet that uh, you know is very likely to shake us away from its surface when we don't change the way of our behavior. I wonder if uh, Charlotte has a question to anyone. Sure. I mean, I think this whole um, question That's of materiality right. also shows a bit how much capitalism is inscribed in technology and that we maybe should also try to overcome that first um, to, to save the nature. And um, yeah, I thought uh, if um, Caroline and Nicolas, like if, how do you come to the material um, you're using? Are you thinking about like, okay, what kind of material you're using to to show this in this um, working process? 
Yeah, we come to this from two sides. One is just um, to really technically um, buy, learn, and uh, use the technology that is available at the moment. So maybe just to encode black boxes, I think. So that's what we really interested in, to, to get new technologies and, and study them, that they cannot surprise us <laughs> and, and know how to do them. Yeah. yeah, and then when it comes to making an artwork, we do the different. So we try to um, buy the, the single parts uh, to be as um, not um, depending on the companies, what they sell, what they offer. We try to be free or be very hard but with electronics because in China, they, they have, um, all the PCB parts are produced and they are ready and fast and cheap. We also use them, but we try at the beginning to learn all the steps to make them ourselves to, to see what solution it could be, or maybe if there are different, if there's something embedded in the design already, that we just take it from granted, but we could influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think um, by studying these technologies, our concept of, of our uh, objects uh, then sometimes change because we, we, we find new, new ideas. In, in these materials. So I think it's an important process for us. On the other, on the one side is there's always a conceptual uh, thinking, but while making and studying uh, techniques, we, we uh, develop these concepts. And yeah, I think it, it comes from both sides. Yeah. I mean, like, it's super interesting because also each material has its own history and what it was used for. And yeah. So, well. I think our our the, the course of our discussion comes uh, like really now uh, from unveiling to uh, the politics of representation indeed including you know the the, the choice of materials uh, you you use also but also you know when it comes to choosing a certain uh, like symbolic or metaphorical or you know whatever form of the artwork or the strategy of working with the you know uh, um, the, the artwork as such you use this is this is then then you know the the, the the this very exciting part of artistic of creative process um, because certainly all of you start from uh, you know understanding certain multi-layered processes and structures and you know you you are all interested like working across this big field we had this have this still this huge title media internet but but i think with the course of our talk we we see that you know understanding is only the first part and just as uh, joanna said you have to know to to, to you know you have to understand to 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 know what you see and to see so seeing is knowing first <clears throat> but then the next part is really uh you know happens in uh, on 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 the layer of the artwork itself how it shall be constructed you know what material to use what strategies uh, and you know what visual uh, language or components visual audio components what what you know which to use uh, so that they would be able to yeah, to somehow uh, make us aware of those narratives uh, I guess because each artwork is also a kind of narrative proposes you know it's its own style being <coughs> influenced by 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 the artist so um uh, we, we slowly came from visualizing to uh, really materializing those um, ideas uh, <clears throat> so i think i would like to to ask um joanna for you know uh, either a question or a closing comment um uh, we are slowly uh, yeah slowly. well i mean i'm I'm very curious about uh, what Charlotte talked about um, this plant thing and put data into the plants. And I wonder why you think this is a good idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you 
Um, okay, it's actually not about if this is a good idea. It's more um, um, a thinking space of what happens, uh, because for sure we are running out of uh, materials, um, to, um, resources, and so. And people are actually, because I read an article, I think like five years ago or something, that people are trying to put um, DNA in, in plants to, to look if they can um, storage that <coughs> and later have access to it. And I thought, okay, what would it mean if, um, if, if this is happening? To, because you can, you can breed plants. You can, it's not that easy to hide plants also because they spread their semens and stuff. So, so what, what would it mean for a whole system of knowledge if, if that would be happening? And I think this is quite an, an interesting approach about mm. archives, knowledge, how is it stored, who has access, who hasn't access. And okay, yeah, that was more. Um, all right, all right. Mm -hmm. I somehow a little bit like putting code on paper so <laughs> yeah. maybe the plants you can you can feel it you get to you know it you you know what it is so maybe <laughs> and uh, i think the, to store data in in in, in an object you know it's maybe more like the, the seeing how you can see the data how to get can get to it you may like the code in the paper. Yeah, I think that the, you know, in this case, when we started to talk about this materiality, the, the if you think of our, of of plants, they are like both. They are like the the, the objects, the creations, and the self self uh, um, contained archive of that creature. Because you know, they 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 really. Uh, uh, I think of trees, for instance, were one of the oldest, uh, like longest, longest living. They have organisms on the world, uh, uh, in the world. They they uh, they are capable of of living really long, long life, right? <laughs> and they are self-contained archives of that mechanism that you know, like. Um, repeats all the procedures uh, across, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, doesn't need anything besides, uh, you know, sunlight and water and good soil. This is this is really if you if you think of you know how a tree functions, you, you really think. I mean, it, this is divine. You know, <laughs> this is some some organism that should be uh, you know ruling the world because they. Yeah, they are all in, interconnected. They contain all the, you know, archived data. <laughs> Let's say they, you know, uh, don't do any harm. There are they, 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 you know, are capable of communicating with each other um, using the the chemical um, uh, um, uh, let's say communication system. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so uh, within the field of art, um, yeah, we can we can you know even if we work with that very advanced technology, um, we very likely come to you know loving trees and you know at the end uh, we, we 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 really think you know that it is not the technology that should save us or we should think of that you know this is the mean to saving the planet it's you know it's really us and it's about the changing this 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 prevailing narrative uh really looking at you know the point where we are in 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 the world and where m maybe we should be <clears throat> And uh, maybe just really a closing remark for, for me: this uh, power of art to unveil all these, you know, tiny <laughs> plots of or, or parts of the biggest plot uh, is is, is uh, very very exciting, and uh, it's one of the like for me most important roles of art that you know together we can somehow unveil some parts that you know combine together might maybe hopefully possibly change at least something in our approach 
So thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you. Joanna, thank you. Charlotte, Caroline, and Nicolas. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess we, 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 um, yeah, the Kanoko san in the studio will take over. She's ready. So we will slowly disappear from the live transmission. <laughs> However, there is, you know, really lots of materials to see. Not all of the talks are um, English, but uh, I think, yeah, there is, you know, the SIAF TV contributes a lot to to our problems with, um, yeah, resources. <laughs> <laughs> It makes you want to watch, you know. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you, Kanoko everyone, for the morning talk for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kanoko. <laughs> so we hope to see you see each other um, sometime in the future, uh, hopefully soon, in the real life. But until then, um, thank you for joining us, and enjoy the rest of SIF TV too. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.